Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Madhavanti Ghosh, and I'm the Ostoff Associate Curator of Indian, Southeast Asian, and Himalayan art at the Art Institute of Chicago. It gives me great pleasure to greet you all this evening. Um, at this point, may I please request all of you to make sure that your phones are on silent? Our speaker tonight, Dr. Nicola Revere, is our Daniel F. and Ada L. Rice Research Fellow since 2023. Nicola received his doctoral degree from the Sorbonne and specializes in the Hindu and Buddhist art and archaeology of early Southeast Asia with a research focus on pre-modern Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia. He spent nearly two decades teaching and researching at the Thammasat University in Bangkok and is general editor of Before Siam, Essays in Art and Archaeology, published in 2014, and Decoding Southeast Asian Art, um, Studies in Honor of Piriya Kriya Kish uh, in 2022. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Nicola Rivera, who will be delivering the lecture Dwaravati Art and the Culture of Early Thailand Between Tradition and Innovation tonight. Thank you. Nicola. A very good evening. Thank you, Madhu, for the nice introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight for this lecture. I'm not uh, sure how many of you have been to Thailand and uh, how much you already know about the early history of Thailand, but <clears throat> I will do my best to enlighten you about the early uh, history of Thailand and the so-called Dvarvati art and culture. So uh, to begin with, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we know and what we don't know about Dvarvati art and history and culture. So first, with the name. Dvarvati is not a Thai name. Uh, it's coming from Sanskrit, Sanskrit language from India, and it refers to depending on uh, your discipline, if you're an, an art historian, an archaeologist, or um, an historian, you may apply different view and concepts in to what we mean by Dvarvati. So it's often referred to a period of time for the early history of Thailand and Southeast Asia, which depending on authors and scholars uh, can be uh, defined as starting from basically the proto-historical period from the 4th, 5th century common era up until in some textbooks to the 12th, 13th century common era that is just before the uh, arising of the Thai, later Thai kingdoms of Sukhothai, Ayutthaya, etc. Um, in my personal view, and I will show you arguments why tonight, I tend to limit the historical period of what we call Dvarvati to roughly the 7th, 8th century only. Not really before, nor after. Art historians also qualify an art style to label it Dvarvati, so-called Dvarvati art, and we'll show you some examples of that and archaeologists extend it to a material culture, encompassing architecture and <clears throat> everyday uh, common culture coming from excavations. So it's sort of a very flexible <clears throat> concept, depending on who you are and where you're coming from. So, as I said, Dvarvati is a Sanskrit name. In Indian mythology, for example, in uh, epics of the Mahabharata and the various chapters and Puranas texts, refer to the legend of Krishna, Krishna, the avatar of Vishnu. <clears throat> Dvarvati, also known as Dvaraka, 
in uh, Indian lore, is the city or the capital city of Lord Krishna. Okay? Which means, Dvara means uh, gates, and Vati qualify a city, a town. So basically a city, a fortified city with gates. That is the meaning of Dvaravati. Um, if you visit Gujarat state in Western India, there is today a modern town known as Dwarka, Dwarka from Dvaraka, the Sanskrit name, and some people believe this is the origin, original location of Dvaravati from the epics, the Mahabharata, etc. And so again, so it refers back to the legend and story of God Vishnu in Hinduism, <clears throat> and more specifically to his avatar <clears throat> known as Krishna. Okay? Krishna is uh, one of the avatars of Lord Vishnu, and here you see him. He is quite popular in the region, in early Southeast Asia, all the way to uh, pre Angkor period in Cambodia. So Pnomda is, I'm sorry, Pnomda is an early site in lower Cambodia. So you find some images of Krishna uplifting the mountain. And we also find a few images of Vishnu Krishna in Sitep, Upper Central Thailand. I will show you a map in a minute. What we know about the history of Dvarvati mostly comes from written sources, I mean, comes from Chinese sources from the early Tang period, 7th century, from the traveling accounts of certain monks who traveled to, from China to India, such as Xuanzang or Yi Jing in the 7th century. Especially Yi Jing who traveled through the maritime route, including Southeast Asia. Uh, <clears throat> even though those monks didn't make it stop, uh, as far as we know, uh, precisely in what is today Thailand, central Thailand, at least they refer to the place, the, core, the, the country, name. So these are the Chinese variants and names, spellings, which are Chinese transcription and pronunciation of a Sanskrit name. So Tuolopoti is the Chinese pronunciation of Sanskrit Dvarvati. And according to these accounts, they locate this country, foreign country, somewhere between ancient kingdoms of Sheikh Shetra in upper central Myanmar or Burma and Ishanapura, the ancient capital of Chenla, another Chinese name, which is ancient Cambodia, basically, before the rise of the Angkor Kingdom. So somewhere in between, somewhere in between what is today Myanmar and Cambodia. What is in between is Thailand. So this is a regional map, <coughs> traveling account, which is hypothetic. We don't know exactly, but um, <coughs> we think Yijing traveled in the late seventh century and stopped sometime many years in possibly Sumatra around Palambang, and then onwards to Nalanda to study Buddhism, and came back the same way. Besides Chinese um, written texts and accounts, we have inscriptions. And among these inscriptions are numismatic inscriptions on coins or um, medals, rather, silver medals. So not very many, possibly a dozen of those have been uh, found and well-known and published, found in different Dvarvati sites in central Thailand. And all of those carry on the obverse a certain symbol. So in this case, it's the symbol of a cow with the calf, the baby of the cow, which is an auspicious symbol of fertility. And on the reverse, you have this inscription in the ancient script, sometimes 
named Pallava script, never mind the name, ancient script derived from Indian uh, Brahmi script, but the language is again Sanskrit, and it reads Sri Dvaravati Shvara Punya, which we can translate as we go backwards. Uh, I'm sorry. Oops. Punya is a common uh, n- uh, word in Sanskrit and, and Pali to designate the work of merit. And as you probably know, the Buddhists like to make merits to uh, the Buddha or the Buddhist monks. And then Ishvara in this context will design the Lord, the Lord of Dvaravati. Okay? So, now when these uh, first medals, inscribed medals, were discovered in the 1950s and deciphered and read, um, several publications uh, ensued, and one of the popular and often cited uh, articles would uh, designate, talk about a Buddhist king or lord of Dvarvati uh, ruling in the area of Nakhon Patom. And I will come back to this name, the site of Nakhon Patom in a moment, which ruled around the 7th century common era in what is today Thailand. Now, I emphasize this because the assumption back then in the 60s, up until recently, was that the lord or the king of the Varvati was necessarily a Buddhist king. Okay? Now, I would like to nuance that a little bit because uh, the ideology of making merit is not exclusive and is not unique to Buddhism. We should make clear of that. And Hinduism and Jainism also have similar concepts of making merit. And there are indeed many inscriptions found in early Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Indonesia, etc., that refers to the worship of Shiva or God Vishnu and making merit as well. So, my point is that it is not necessarily the case that the Lord or the King of Dvarvati, whoever he was, was a Buddhist king. Beside uh, numismatic evidence, we have a couple of stone inscriptions, very few, in fact. One of which is this inscription, uh, which is fragmentary, unfortunately, but this inscription was found on the base of a Buddha image. And the inscription in Sanskrit, in this particular case, seemed to refer to a queen, a Devi, Devi will, in this context, uh, refer to a queen who may or may not be the daughter of the Lord of the Arati. And that queen, apparently, in this case, set up the image of the Tathagata, which in this case is a synonym for the Buddha. So here we seem to have a Buddhist queen making merit. Okay? Now, Buddhist queen, but not necessarily the case that the king was a Buddhist. It's often the case in ancient India that uh, the queen uh, at the court would be a Buddhist and the king would be a Shaiva or Vaishnava. Okay? No exclusivity again. Now, let's go over uh, a few key sites, Dvarvati sites in central Thailand, and show you some material that was found there. So here is a local map of central Thailand, so the modern capital of Bangkok, of course, um, unknown at the time in the first millennium. The most ancient sites in central Thailand are in black, so these sites, including Nakhon Patom. Now, Nakhon Patom is the modern name. I will go back to it in a minute. And Possibly, Nakhon Patom was a capital of that area at the time. 
So Nakhon Pator is the Thai modern name, which again comes from, in this case, Pali. Pali and Sanskrit are very close. And Nakhon comes from Nagara, the city. Patom comes from Patama the first. So the first city, the prominent, most important city. Remember, these are modern names coined in the 19th century. Okay? We don't actually know the ancient name of these cities. <clears throat> now, the reason for this is that, indeed, back in the 19th century, late 19th century, when uh, interest in the early regional and local history started to arose, this is when the scholars at the time, the first historians of the region, started to find ancient material, ancient structures, uh, temples, ancient sculptures, including many Buddha images and Buddhist material. So here we have on the left a beautiful head of a meditating Buddha, made not in stone but in terracotta, possibly ornamenting the base of a monument, a stupa possibly, a Buddhist monument. And to the right, you see a recently excavated, uh, possibly a guardian, a dvarapala, a guardian uh, guarding an ancient site. Again, made of uh, terracotta in this case, so very fragile. These are pretty recent uh, material excavated just a few years ago from Nakhon Patom. Um, so, excavated recently. In addition to these uh, sculptures, is this very important inscription from Wat Pangam. This is the modern name of the temple where it was found. We don't know the ancient name again. And this fragmentary inscription in Sanskrit is relatively important because for the first time it gives the name in Sanskrit of Dvarvati in a Dvarvati site. And uh, in stanza number five, it reads in Sanskrit, it seems to give the name, the ancient name of a city here, which we don't really know where and what it was, possibly the ancient name of Nakhon Patom, and making comparison of this ancient city with Dvarvati. Like, it is like Dvarvati, the city of Vishnu, Vishnu God. So it is possible that this city name, ancient name, was the ancient name of Nakhon Patom, and that uh, allusions are made to the Indi in Indian epics, such as the Mahabharata, etc., naming uh, the city of Vishnu, but also other gods. Other inscriptions have been found for a long time in Nakhon Patom, including several Buddhist inscriptions in Pali language. So Pali language is also a language uh, very close to Sanskrit, but it denotes a particular school of Buddhism, which is known today as Theravada Buddhism. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So these Buddhist inscriptions in Pali, uh, Buddhist formulas and Buddhist texts, basically, so these are called citation inscriptions. They're not donative inscriptions, they are citing the text, the sacred text. Uh, so this is the modern inscription, as you can see, uh, hardly decipherable, in sight. This, a uh, particular example comes from a modern uh, temple uh, enclaved in, on the wall. And right below here, you see a modern inscription dated 1856, which was written by the Thai King Mongkut, or Rama IV, in, uh, when he just ascended the throne. And it, King Mongkut at the time, or Rama IV, uh, sort of try to uh, describe the early history of the region, including Nakhon Patom. And 
finding these uh, fragments and sculptures and inscription, he started to make uh, hypotheses about the coming of Buddhism into Thailand in the early days. And quote, for example, mentioning these Buddhist formulas that were found in origin, he, the king, <coughs> wrote, quote, these formulas came from Madhya Pradesh in today, India, and have been sent along with relics of Samanera Gautama, that is the Buddha, historical Buddha, to all Buddhist countries, including what is today Thailand. And these formulas are, was narrated at the time as a precious thing at the time of the great king Dhammashoka in Indian lore, great king Ashoka, third century BCE. So the idea was that you may be familiar with the idea that King Ashoka spread Buddhism to all over countries, including a mission, a Buddhist mission to what is known today uh, as Southeast Asia, to the golden land of Suvanabhumi. So this is the idea behind. A bit later, a few years later, um, a son of King Rama IV, Prince Damrong, known in Thailand as the father of Thai history, was really the first scholar to start writing books and articles around the early history of Thailand and the region. And in one of his publications, talking about the introduction of Buddhism in Siam, remember that Siam was the old name of Thailand up until 1939. Siam became Thailand in 1939. So that Buddhism, quote, was first established in today Thailand when Nakhon was the capital may be deduced from the archaeological remains found at this uh, monument known as Pra Patom Shedi and concluding, coming to the conclusion that Buddhism was introduced in Siam or Thailand some 500 years Buddhist era, BE denotes the Buddhist era. In Thailand, Buddhist era start after the death of the Buddha, 543 BCE. So we're talking about around Christian era. So that was the belief back then, this is early 20th century. The belief was that Buddhism indeed reached the shore of Thailand very early on. And <clears throat> this is the monument that was just mentioned. Pa Patom Shedi, this is the Thai name, but it's actually derived from Pali, Sanskrit, Patama, the first, Shediya, Stupa, or Shedi. So the belief was that uh, this particular monument, which you may have seen, uh, not this very monument, because this is modern, a modern uh, 19th century reconstruction, but that this big, huge stupa, in fact, the biggest in Thailand and possibly Southeast Asia, uh, enshrined an older stupa, as it can be seen in this painting, which may date back to the Ayutthaya period, so possibly 15, 14, 15th century. And that same monument may have enshrined an even older monument, going back to possibly the Dvarvati period and even further back as can be seen in these modern paintings. So all these murals are modern, and they are taken from temples in Akon Patom. So this is the belief, the, the popular belief, up till today, that Pa Patom Shedi was the first stupa enshrining relics of the Buddha sent at the time of King Ashoka, third century BCE, which uh, is all hypothetical because no uh, scientific archaeological excavation had ever, ever been conducted at the site, unfortunately. So we just don't know what's under. And so this relates to the uh, idea of Nakhon Patom being the capital, the center, the Buddhist center of the Golden Land, or Suvanabhumi in the region, to be the first Buddhist country in the region. But in fact, Yes, of course, there is quite a few Buddhist inscriptions and sculptures, but there are also a few 
Hindu material earlier, uh, from the early period, that is the first millennium, such as lingas. Lingas are uh, phallic representation of God Shiva. So, so this is, these are old photographs. Here it's gone. This is a modern picture. Uh, but it's actually been uh, removed to another area. So that is an ancient Shiva Lingam found in Nakampatam, for example. And other evidence that may point towards the worship uh, of uh, Hindu gods, such as a base like this one. And indeed, in a region, this is not clear, uh, quite Nakampatam, a little bit further to the west in Kanchanaburi province, uh, images of Vishnu have been found, four-armed Vishnus from possibly 7th, 8th century on style and iconography. And these have been published. Look at the facial features, very localized facial features with broad nose, joint eyebrows, and these are common in what we call Dvarvati art, which in fact is Mon art. A little bit to the south of Nakonpatom is an ancient site known as Kubua in Lachab uh, Lachaburi province. And several, it was, this was an ancient city with many stupas or shatiyas found there. And uh, particularly interesting are the um, stucco or terracotta uh, fragments that were decorating the ancient uh, base of the monument, such as these uh, female musicians here, which probably derive from a narrative, possibly a story of the past of the Buddha Jataka story. So here you have these female musicians. And if you look more closely at their face, facial features, they relate very clearly, statistically speaking, to the Vishnu image that I have shown, just shown you a minute ago. Also from Kubua, uh, examples of bodhisattva imagery are found. So in this case, possibly the head to the left of bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great bodhisattva of compassion of Mahayana Buddhism. And here it can be compared, this is what I call between tradition and innovation, can be compared to uh, some early Indian examples from Western India, the Ajanta Cave number one, for instance, uh, in mural painting. So stylistically, it's quite similar. Another key Dvarvati site is to the north, known as Utong, modern name, Thai name, which means cradle or source of gold. Again, possibly referring back to the legend of the Golden Land uh, in Supanburi province. So cradle of gold, source of gold. In fact, very few golden images are to be found in a region. At least they have not reached us. <clears throat> and early uh, fragments, Buddhist monks uh, were found here. So here we seem to, to have three monks in a row holding a bowl, which is interesting because this is a modern drawing refers back to the Buddhist idea, tradition of giving homes to monks, okay? In the Buddhist tradition, at least in the Theravada Buddhist tradition up to today, uh, monks are beggars. They go out every morning, early morning, before uh, sunrise, and they are begging their food. And good Buddhists should uh, make uh, uh, this opportunity to make merit, to give food, and money, possibly, and to make merit. So this is a tradition going back to the time of the Buddha. Okay? In fact, the Chinese monk Yijing in the seventh century would travel from China to India and stop by Southeast Asia, also refer to this tradition, which was sort of unknown in China, I believe, in Mayana Buddhism. So, quote, in Dvarvati, or Tuolopoti, there are many who perform the begging austerity, dutta or dutanga in Sanskrit. 
and indeed common scene if you visit Thailand, Laos, Burma, Cambodia, and uh, if you are an early bird, uh, you just go out on the street and you will see these scenes every day on a daily basis. Monks walking bare feet and begging for their food. Bhikkhu or Bhikshu in Sanskrit literally means beggars. Okay, so these are beggar monks. So at Wutong, um, an inscription has been found, a copper sheet inscription here, also in Sanskrit, which is interesting for my purpose because it gives us a name of possibly a king in Sanskrit, named Arshavarman. And he is designed as the grandson of King Ishanavarman. Now, for those of you who know a little bit of the early history of Southeast Asia, King Ishanavarman was the great king of Shenla, ancient Cambodia, before the rise of the Angkor Kingdom in the 7th century. And so he, Arshavarman, made uh, offering of gifts to two royal lingams, so to Shiva, basically. So here we have a testimony of a king named Arshavarman who made uh, donations to a Shaiva uh, god. And this is found in Utong. And indeed, we have found a few lingam with the face of Shiva on it, Ika Muka Lingam. Um, also found in a little to the south of Wutong, in Kok Changdin, were several uh, structures excavated, scientifically excavated in the 90s, I believe. And as part of the found were these uh, pottery recipients with coins in there. And these were uh, foundation deposits found in small uh, shrines. And in this particular deposit, you have a hoard of coins inside, uh, silver, bronze, gold uh, coins or medals. This is a view of it. And as part of this hoard of ancient coins were a few Dvarvati coins with the inscription. <coughs> um, with the same, very same inscription, Shri Dvarvati Shvarapunya, this is the great work of merit of the Lord of Dvarvati. Okay? So whoever that Lord, King of Dvarvati was, we don't know his name, he was making merit at this site, among others in the region. So the question that has uh, interested historians for so many decades up to now is who was the Lord of Dvarvati? We presume he was a king, a ruler of this region, but we don't know anything about him or them. It could have been just one king, it could have been several, a lineage of kings, we just don't know. We don't have dates, we don't have names. Okay? So it's a sort of a kingdom without history we're talking about here. And whoever he was, uh, why does he call himself the Lord of the Rati. I mean, what does he make? What, what's in the name? Okay? There is clearly this reference going back to the Indian epics, such as the Mahabharata, and this association with, seemingly, with uh, the avatar of Vishnu, Krishna. Okay? Because really, in Indian mythology, the Lord of the Rati is Krishna. And in fact, we know uh, there are some uh, Indian kings from Western India around the 10th to the 14th century who made exactly the same claim. They were the Yadava kings in Western India, and in their inscription, they often uh, qualified as the, uh, the overlord of Dharvati, the best of cities, claiming themselves as uh, an incarnation of uh, Vishnu on earth. Okay, so this clear association between kingship and royalty and uh, uh, God Vishnu. We mentioned a, min a few minutes ago the king, the great king of Shenda, Ishan Avraman, who is known by many inscriptions in ancient Cambodia. 
including in one single uh, golden coin or medal, probably not a monetary uh, coin, but used for some uh, foundation of temples, mentioning the name of the city, Ishanapura. Pura means the city. Most likely referring to Sambo Prikuk, the ancient capital in uh, uh, the ancient uh, kingdom of Cambodia, Changla, and himself, Ishanavalman. So we have Dwarvati in what is around central Thailand today. We have Chenla. So Chenla is a Chinese name. Okay? We don't, well, in this case, we, we know the capital name of the kingdom, Ishanapura, I just said, but the entire country, we don't know the name. So where does Chenla hands? Where does Dvarvati begin? Those questions are uh, asked and we don't really know. And what about other polities, early polities from the region? Some we know their old name, many we don't know. For example, Sitep. Sitep is a modern Thai name, which you may have heard recently. Uh, a few months ago, the site of Sitep has been listed as World Heritage. Uh, and other names. This is a map retrieved from Wikipedia. Dravati uh, is in this uh, description qualified, so, sort of covering the entire central, north, and northeast region of Thailand, which I think is a bit too much. Ari Punshai is the ancient name for Lampun today, just south of Chiang Mai. So this is the Wikipedia map. This is my map in red. I tend to uh, limit the area of the ancient culture and kingdom of Varvati to this area, central West Thailand, based on material inscriptions and the wider, much broader kingdom of Chenla or empire to what is today ancient Cambodia, but also covering part of East and Northeast Thailand today in the 7th, 8th century. Now, interestingly, other Dvarvati uh, cities are known in inscriptions. For example, in Cambodia, two late inscriptions from the 10th century refer to uh, a country named Dvarvati. Same in Myanmar. And in fact, Dvarvati, like I said, refers to the uh, capital of Lord Krishna in the epics. And it's not surprising that ancient Indianized cultures and kings would take this name and other names such as Sri Vijaya, that's another example, as a common name, just like today. Uh, I mean, you can, you can have many cities just like Paris in the US. I don't know how many Paris there are in the US, but there are quite a few. So same, same uh, phenomenon with Dvarvati and all these names, okay? We don't have to think of only one Dvarvati, but there could be many in different time period as well. And in fact, Dvarvati is also known in much later sources up to the early Bangkok period. It was actually part as an epithet of the old long name of the new capital which commonly is known as Bangkok, but the real official name is much longer. It's in fact the longer official name in the world. Um, City of Angels, Ayutthaya, that's another common name, Ayutthaya, which also refer back to an ancient capital. Ayutthaya, Ayutthaya in Sanskrit refers to the city of Rama. Rama is another avatar of uh, God Vishnu. And so similarly with Varati and Lord uh, Krishna. Art, art style. So we're talking about early Buddhist, the earliest Buddhist cultures you find in the region, not just Thailand, but Southeast Asia. So in fact, around this juncture, six, seven, eight century, it's quite difficult for scholars to sometimes determine the differences between what is pre-Angkorian art, 
what is Dvarvati art, what is Pew art, etc., etc. And I'm giving you uh, some examples here, three different Buddha heads from different countries, found in different countries, but uh, stylistically, iconographically, they are very much alike, except perhaps the materiality, the stone can be different. So for example, the Dvarvati uh, Buddha head in this case, uh, at the bottom, is made of limestone, whereas in other regions, in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, it was only sandstone, for example. So this can help us to determine the origins of Buddha images sometimes. This is the entire standing Buddha images, again, from different countries, one from Cambodia, one found in uh, southern Laos, and one found in Thailand. So guess which one is from Thailand? To the left, that one. And again, Stylistically, iconographically speaking, certainly it is very much alike, although the hands are broken in this case, they were most likely performing the same teaching gesture with two hands at the same level. Besides standing images, you have many cross-leg Buddha images, but also, peculiarly speaking, quite popular in Dvarvati art are pen and leg Buddha images, what I call enthroned Buddha images. Okay? So these were sometimes colossal images, four meters high, from Nakhon Patom, these ones. And um, they seem to show the Buddha as a king, a king of Dharma, possibly. Other uh, depiction, this is a narrative slab <clears throat> which is today can be seen in Bangkok, but it has been removed from uh, Nakhon Patom, and it shows the Buddha, Antron Buddha, teaching, such as here as well, teaching to uh, different people and performing the great miracle here. And in Indian art, uh, the, in the Western caves in Maharashtra, you find many depictions of uh, Antron Buddha, such as this, and here, note, for example, at the top, uh, two angels carrying a crown over the head of a Buddha. So clearly the ideology of kingship is very important in his imagery. So uh, these are cave reliefs, more examples of an enthroned Buddha teaching to gods Shiva and Vishnu, in this case, to sort of show the superiority of Buddhism over Hinduism. Here you have an example of a Buddha standing on the top of a hybrid creature, which is known as a Garuda. Garuda is half man, half eagle, and he is the mount of God Vishnu. Okay? So these are a couple of examples found in the region. And similarly, you have uh, examples of a Buddha standing on a sort of hybrid creature we call a monster. We don't really know the names. This one is here at the Art Institute. And this hybrid monster could be a mixture of a goose, a eagle, with horns, so possibly uh, the bull as well. We don't really know the meaning. It has been speculated that this imagery, which is unique to central Thailand, so Dvarvati art, really. This is a very good marker of what is Dvarvati art. Uh, can be uh, showing a sky lecture of the Buddha to the gods, etc. The Buddha flying. Very peculiar to central Thailand are <clears throat> stone wheels or Dharma chakras. They're uh, many found in associated Dvarvati sites, Nakhon Patom, Utong, etc., usually made of stone. Some are quite big, and some of them are inscribed with Pali inscriptions, Pali text. So these are a couple of examples. There was a great show some 10 years ago at the Met. Uh, you may have seen several of these uh, uh, sculptures loaned from Thailand. This is one example. And these wheels, Dharma Chakras, were standing on top of pillars, such as here. And possibly the, the Buddha on monster stair were attached to, by a tenon and a mortise to the uh, wheel. 
This is hypothesis. The uh, imagery of Dharma Chakras, of course, is well known in India itself, going back to Sanchi, for example. And we think that these uh, Dharma Chakras, standing on pillars, were demarcating the sacred sites, or, or stupas, or shatya. And I'd like here to draw a comparison with another culture of Northeast Thailand, which is a Konnet culture, Mon culture, but not what I define as Dvarvati. So these are Sima stones, boundary markers. Some are quite big, two, three meters high, and often they are decorated, ornamented with Buddha imagery, life episodes of the Buddha, uh, past episodes of the Buddha, etc. But these are found only in Isan or Northeast Thailand, not in Central Thailand. So there is clearly this. The Dharma Chakra wheels found in Central Thailand and the boundary markers found in Northeast. So two uh, different material culture here. Interestingly though, uh, in at least one of these Sima stones, you find a depiction of a monk with a staff, ornamented staff, which is known in Sanskrit as Kakara. And this is an, an, uh, an artifact found in Nakhon Pathom. So this is exactly what you see here. So is it possible that a monk holding this type of staff was uh, traveling to Nakhon Patom, I suppose? Chinese monk Yijing gives us a description of this uh, working staff. And he said they were used by monks to keep off cows or dogs while collecting homes. So this is going back to the tradition of begging homes. But this stuff can make noise, so it's easy to, it's also a ringing bell. Gling, 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 I'm coming, okay. So images of the Buddha can also be found reclining. They are quite rare, usually found in uh, cliffs or caves, such as here, possibly representing the passing away of the Buddha. Last part of my presentation will briefly touch on more inscriptions. I've already referred to the Sanskrit inscriptions referring to the name of Varvati, but we also have, crucially, a few inscriptions in vernacular language, that is a local language, and that language is not Thai, it's Mon, M-O-N. So the Mon ethnic group were, in the first millennium, populating most of what is today Thailand. So what is today Thailand was actually Mon land at the time. Um, and we know that from inscriptions, <coughs> donative inscriptions in this case, sometimes also found inscribed on Buddha images. For example, here, this is a Mon inscription offering this Buddha image to make merit. Unfortunately, we don't have the other side, which will give us the name of that person. Uh, bilingual inscriptions in Pali language, the sacred language of Theravada Buddhism, and Mon donative inscriptions. Pali inscriptions citing the four truths of Buddhism, life is suffering, etc., to inscribe on these uh, stone wheel or Dhamma chakras. And more Pali inscriptions on pedestal, Buddha images, etc., etc. So, and this is, I'm coming to an end. Uh, mapping all this evidence, especially epigraphic evidence for the presence of Buddhism in a region, we have a cluster of Pali inscriptions in red. You see all the red dots? This is where Pali inscriptions were found. And these are clear marker for the presence of what is known today as Theravada Buddhism. And this is going back to the 7th century, approximately. And then we have inscriptions, vernacular inscriptions in Mon language, sky blue. Khmer language, of course, uh, I haven't mentioned here, but quite a few also found in Northeast Thailand. And the yellow, in yellow, these are Sanskrit inscriptions. Okay? So we have a cluster of Pali inscription in Central Thailand. Whereas 
vernacular Mon language are found more broadly, both in Central and Northeast Thailand. Okay? So this is to say that we cannot say that all Mon land at the time was actually or Ramana, Ramanya Desha, that would be the more common uh, term, was Dvarvati, and similarly, Dvarvati was not just Mon. So based on all these uh, brief presentation and material, culture, and evidence, we may conclude that during the mid to late first millennium in central Thailand, at least one ruler, possibly more, identified himself as the Lord of Dvarvati, possibly making allusion to Lord Krishna. The material culture was clearly grounded in Indic artistic traditions coming from India rather than Sri Lanka. We don't know exactly where, but we, we, we can discuss this further. But also with local innovation, okay? For example, the Buddha on monster stairs are unique to central Thailand, okay? Pali Buddhism, or if you prefer Theravada Buddhism, was well established, but also coexisted with Brahmanism or Hinduism, and possibly Mayana Buddhism as well. The population, local population in the area used Mon as their vernacular language. That is, the donation inscriptions were composed in Mon only. We don't know any other local language from this area. That is not to say that there were only Mons, but at least the Mons were there. But we cannot affirm that Dvarvati kingdom was very extensive, going all the way up to Alipunshai or Lampun or Northeast, for example. It's quite localized to central Thailand in my view, that it was a very lengthy period of time, say from the 5th to the 11th, 12th century. I sort of narrow it down to the 7th, 8th century, and that it was a unified Buddhist and Mon kingdom and culture and that it should not be mixed with <clears throat> the northern uh, culture, Mon culture from around the region of Lampun or Northeast Thailand as well. Okay, and that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that was a very, quite long uh, presentation, but we do have a couple of minutes for burning questions. If you dare to speak in the microphone, please. Maybe one or two questions. Oh, uh, Professor, I have a question. Uh, regarding the idea of, I want to say the word, Devarti, that it may have begun as, say, um, a set of teachings that evolved uh, from the Buddha and Buddhism but they kind of took root in a certain city and they were, you know, propagated there. And then after that, is it possible that individuals would <clears throat> leave that area, go to another area, you know, whether 50, 100, or 200 miles, and then wanting to give some authority to their teachings to say, oh, well, I am from Devarti, the city, that, that that, you know, may have been why there's not a specific place that they know to be Devarti, um, because it was everywhere. Okay, so sort of legitimizing their origins. Sure. I'm not sure there was a question there, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Another question? to the left. Um, to uh, establish a temple um, uh, in, in early Buddhism in Thailand, um, was India sending relics over to Thailand in order to establish Buddhist temples? So the question was, were there any, I didn't hear one, 
re reliques to be sent? Uh, uh, yeah, um, in, in, in early Buddhism, well, uh, in, in so, order to okay. establish temples in Thailand, was sure. India sending relics Sure, sure. I mean, the idea, uh, the spread of sending relics all over the place is certainly very strong in uh, Buddhist text uh, tradition. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, some reliquary shrines have been found and discovered, uh, including in Thailand. But to say that these relics are actually the relics of the Buddha, <laughs> that is very uh, difficult to say in most cases. And unfortunately, in uh, quite a few key sites, such as pa Patom Shidi, which I've shown earlier in Akon Patom, the site has not been excavated at all, just because it is sacred. So people believe, but we are not, archaeologists are not able to actually uh, excavate and find out whether there was, uh, if, if there are any relics to be found there, uh, ancient relics to be found there. We have time for one more question. Or we can go ahead and conclude. Thank you, Thank you so much, Nicola. Thank Nicolas. you very much.